anything else. Uh, we've had um, RSVPs for this town hall of well over a thousand. We've got 660 people on chat, so I know this is of great interest. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, the purpose of this call is to share updates on restart planning from some key areas in anticipation of an eventual lifting of the governor's order, stay at home, stay at home uh, order, which I understand is still, you know, maybe, maybe pushed back. But as of right now, it's May 29th where people could potentially return to work. And uh, we know there are a lot of questions out there. So President Wilson is going to begin this uh, and he will be followed by Lori Kobo, Dean of our College of Nursing, who also chairs the subcommittee for the public health public health subcommittee for the restart committee that will be followed by uh, Rob Davenport, our AVP for facilities planning and management. And I know there are lots of questions about our facilities. And then finally from Carolyn Hafter because uh, HR has been um, has been very deep as far as figuring out how do we work at home and, and all the rest. We also have on this call a number of other subcommittee chairs and we'll have uh, people address you in the order that I, I mentioned, um, but then we'll have time, a good amount of time, I believe, for Q&A. We've had um, roughly 150 questions submitted. Many of them are similar to each other. They fall into a few categories, and those have been shared with everybody. But we'll also be taking uh, questions from the audience, and they'll they'll be fed to me, and I'll moderate the Q&A afterwards. But first, I'd like to, we'd like to start with President Wilson. I think we're in... Um, we're fortunate to have a medical doctor and an epidemiologist as our leader during this this uncertain time. So, um, and and the president's also been named to a couple of the governor's task forces and, and other things as well, her economic restart task force and her health disparities task force. And, uh, president Wilson, if I could turn it over to you to give an overview. Uh, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. It certainly has been a, a very difficult time. I do appreciate the effort everybody's been making in terms of continuing to get the mission of the university accomplished and and continuing to uh, practice uh, safe uh, safety uh, uh, as a top top priority. Appreciate that. Uh, this is the second uh, restart town hall that we've had. The provost had one. I think it was May eleventh. And it was uh, very well received. It was obvious that a lot of people had an interest in what was going on and, and was hungering for further knowledge. And although he did a, actually a, a fabulous job in answering uh, all the questions that he could, you know, some of the questions um, really more appropriately was in the purview of some of the other committees that we have. And so we thought that, well, maybe we should have another uh, restart meeting like this in which uh, all of the uh, subcommittee uh, chairs could participate so that if there are uh, certain questions that um, uh, you know, just one person may not have the answers to, or at least the details uh, answers to, uh, you would have the, the person in charge of that area being able to uh, answer the questions. So, you know, one of the major things that people are always asking is, you know, what's gonna happen in the fall you know, we prefer to think about this in two phases. As Michael mentioned, the first phase is really what's going to happen on uh, uh, May 29th, because on the 28th, the governor is expected to lift at least uh, some of her uh, directives related to stay at home. And so uh, people want to know, you know, what's actually going to happen on May 29th? Do you come in? Do you not come in? those kinds of questions. So we'll try to focus a bit on that. Phase two is obviously what happens uh, for the fall semester. And just say from the very beginning that we don't have all the answers to that yet. You know, when you really think about it, that's uh, three months away. And I always try to remind people that three months ago, uh, you know, it was a very different situation uh, here. You know, we didn't even have our first uh, case. So uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. In fact, um, Michiganders were uh, continue were um, uh, gathering in very large gatherings, and and uh, people were looking at me all funny when I would uh, not want to shake hands and and would suggest that we elbow bump instead. Uh, and that was two and a half months ago. So a lot can change in three months, and so we want to 
really be guided by the science, guided by the public health realities at that time. And uh, we try to answer as many uh, questions as we can, uh, but just understand that we don't have all the answers uh, for phase two yet. Um, we've always been guided by four principles. The safety of our campus is, is number one. It's number one priority, hands down. We want to continue the mission of the university. I mean, just because we're working differently and we're teaching differently and we're learning differently doesn't mean the university is closed. The university is open and um, you know we will continue the uh, mission of the university. Uh, third, uh, we've learned a lot. And so we want to continue to learn and adapt uh, based on our experiences so far and uh, do things better as we uh, move forward. And then finally, you know, this is no one's fault. This is a natural uh, catastrophe. And so we want to the, to the extent possible, we want people to be um, shielded as much as possible from uh, financial uh, difficulties. And so uh, those have been the you know, principles that we've been guided by. There's been uh, nine subcommittees that's uh, uh, looking at various aspects of what's uh, required for restarting. Uh, so it's very, very comprehensive. It's, it's, I would say it's one of the uh, more comprehensive efforts uh, in the country uh, in terms of uh, number of people involved in this, in this effort and the uh, kind of issues that we're looking at. Um, although although um, you hear from three of the uh, subcommittee uh, chairs, as was mentioned, uh, most of the uh, subcommittee uh, chairs are on this call so um, you can answer, you can ask whatever questions um, uh, you would like to, and uh, we'll see if we can get someone to, to answer. Um, some guidelines on phase one. As I mentioned, you know, we, we don't have all the answers, particularly for phase two, but there are some guidance that we, we can provide for phase one. Uh, the first is that regardless of what the governor's order may be on May 28th. First of all, we don't really know exactly what she's going to say. It is a, her stay at home directive is, is set to expire, but it's likely that she may keep some restrictions in place. Who knows? But regardless of what the details are, we can be more restrictive than what the governor um, directs. So we're going to ask people to, if you can continue to work at home, continue working at home. Um, regardless of what the governor's directive is. We can't be more lenient than the governor, but we can certainly be more restrictive. If you need to go to your offices, you know, clear this with your supervisors, uh, keep to yourself as much as possible, continue to uh, practice safe distancing and follow all of the guidelines. These general guidelines uh, cover expectations, not only for your, yourself, but for anyone who visits our campus. Uh, that's that's uh, we have an open campus. It's very important that we uh, make sure that everybody uh, follows the guidelines because it's to protect you know everyone else. And then finally, you know we really need everyone to follow the guidelines. Uh, I'm reminded when uh, we went to a smoke-free uh, campus, uh, it was you know somewhat successful, but not totally successful. Uh, partly because in order to uh, achieve uh, smoke-free, smoke it required a lot of peer monitoring. And people felt uncomfortable telling someone else that they shouldn't smoke. Well, this is different. This It's not just a nuisance. I mean, this is, you know, people's lives at stake. And so uh, we urge you to um, not only uh, by, by the guidelines yourself, but exert peer pressure on those who are not following the guidelines because it's for everyone's benefit and it's important if this is going to succeed for everyone to be uh, following the guidelines that you're going to be receiving. And just remember, Warrior Safe is Warrior Strong. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, one of our chairs, uh, Lori lazong Klebo, who has been chairing the Public Health Subcommittee and um, this is a, a very interesting committee because it offers support to all of the other uh, subcommittees. This is a, the committee that's made up of the experts, the uh, public health, uh, 
uh, infectious disease, uh, other uh, content experts in this uh, whole area. Um, we've been depending on them a lot for the most current information, not only nationally, but what's happening uh, locally. And they've been a, a great resource for us. So with that, uh, Dean Claybo. Thank you. As President Wilson described, the role of the Public Health Subcommittee is to inform the recommendations for each of the other subcommittees to ensure that they're grounded in emerging science and best practice. Um, the challenge, as you can imagine, is that the evidence is developing at a pretty rapid pace as new knowledge is generated. But the good news is we're not doing this alone. And that in addition to the professional literature, the faculty infectious disease mm -hmm. experts we have on our committee who have access to extensive local and national data, we also have the guidelines from the CDC and we have access to very useful recommendations from organizations like the American College Health Association. And our plans have to be able to adapt to changing circumstances and to new developments. Key work underway in the committee includes a few things and I'll mention a few of those now. First, we're finalizing the development of two education modules that will be completed by all members of the campus community before return. The modules will go live on Canvas with a link from the WSU coronavirus webpage sometime next week, and we'll send out an announcement when they're ready to go. The modules include basic information on COVID-19 and its transmission, as well as new campus-based strategies to promote a safe environment. These strategies include things like specific guidance on wearing a face covering at all times in public spaces on campus, how to care for your face covering. We've received a lot of questions about people with no symptoms spreading the virus. Universal use of face coverings in public is currently considered the best way to reduce asymptomatic spread. The modules will also include information about hand hygiene, reducing or eliminating the use of common shareables like common pens, paper sign-in sheets, things like social distancing, including strategies for the use of elevators and restrooms, directional use of hallways and stairwells in some settings, and temporary closure of many waiting areas, conference rooms, and large public spaces. But another very important strategy is our ability to conduct an ongoing assessment of the overall health of the campus. In the next several days, the employee daily screening procedure, which has been used by critical infrastructure workers as part of the executive order, will transition to a new iteration called the Campus Daily Screener, which will be completed by all members of the community who wish to be physically present on campus every day. This is very important for two reasons. First, it will tell you if you're cleared to come to campus that day, and if not, it will generate a report to your supervisor and to the Campus Health Center. The Health Center staff are trained contact tracers who will conduct further screening and make recommendations for testing and quarantine as medically indicated, as well as notifying those who may have been exposed and notifying facilities regarding cleaning and mitigation. Also equally importantly, aggregate data from all the screens will allow us to assess the ongoing status of the campus on a regular basis. We'll be able to identify clusters or potential spread before they might otherwise become evident. And the Public Health Committee will be able to make recommendations regarding loosening or tightening of restrictions based on real-time data. Daily screening and data monitoring are identified as one of the most important strategies towards moving up to a safe opening by the ACHA. There's lots more to come, but it's important that we emphasize two things. First, the restart will be phased, based in emerging science and guided by real-time data. The lifting of the stay at home does not mean we all rush back to campus. We should gradually increase our footprint as data demonstrates that it's safe to do so. We have access to the local infectious disease experts on our committee and that expertise combined with local and national evidence will guide campus actions. Next, protecting the health of the campus community is a shared responsibility. 
until such time as an effective vaccine is developed and widely available or effective prophylactic treatment is discovered, physical distancing, responsible testing, isolation, quarantine, and systematic contact tracing are our best strategies to promote the health of our community. And the health of the campus community is our highest priority. And now we turn to Rob Davenport, who will provide more detailed information regarding facilities. Thank you, Dean Clavo, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so facilities, uh, Restart Subcommittee is drafting a playbook for all facilities related segments, including custodial services, HVAC air management, space management, parking transportation, and construction services. Uh, the playbook is based on industry standards and governmental regulatory requirements, including the new COVID-19 OSHA standard, uh, CDC standards, ASHRAE standards, and finally, the governor's recent uh, executive order, number 202091, which addresses safeguards to protect Michigan workers. Now, since custodial services are top of mind, I'd like to hover on a few action items that FPNM is, is tracking. First, training custodians. We are engaged in pandemic preventative maintenance cleaning and post case discovery cleaning, training. Now this training addresses specific tasks associated with pandemic cleaning processes. Uh, everybody is engaged in this uh, training program and we expect to get this completed within the next week or so. Uh, we're protecting entrances and exits by utilizing a product known as nanoseptic. Uh, this application is applied to doors, um, door handles, and electronic buttons, primarily elevator and building access control type buttons. Um, in the common area cleaning and, and building um, scenarios, we are addressing high traffic and touch point cleaning to include doors and handrails. On the classroom side of the business, now this is still under development, but we are defining classroom cleaning plans based on occupancy rates, class schedules, frequency of cleaning, and of course, procuring available labor to, uh, to cover these schedules. On the surface cleaning side, we have identified an EPA approved uh, disinfectant that's being utilized throughout campus. Um, you know, we expect this to be a bit of a shared responsibility with regard to surface cleaning. And so um, we are determining the location of spray bottles around campus uh, to make sure we've got those resources available for that purpose. Um, finally, we're considering disinfectant wipes to be available in strategic locations as well. Um, as you may know, procuring these products is difficult, but we have a, a viable and perhaps even reliable supplier in that effort. On the restroom side, um, we're disinfecting equipment and fixtures, stall doors, toilet valve handles, sink faucet handles, soap dispensers, paper towel dispensers. Um, we're also establishing new cleaning frequencies in these areas. Um, and finally, looking into touchless restroom fixtures and equipment uh, where applicable and practical. Uh, regarding sanitizing equipment, we've got hand sanitizer located in specific, at specific entrance points across campus. And also we have ordered two Clorox 360 electrostatic fogging devices and these will be used to perform broad spectrum disinfecting of, of spaces and rooms, et cetera. Finally, our planning and space management team is working with the other subcommittees, faculty, et cetera, to fit test classrooms and other common areas to identify the best means of social distancing. So I'll pause here and introduce Carolyn Hafner. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you, President Wilson, for the opportunity to speak to the campus community today. Um, I am leading the HR Restart Committee with a very large cross-section uh, committee with representatives from faculty, staff, and um, our union representatives, both on the non-academic as well as the academic side. And we are all working very hard 
to support the development of a phased in restart plan uh, to very gradually, as Dean Claybo has said, and, and again, in support of what President Wilson has said, um, limited access on campus. We really support working remotely throughout the summer while we're working on our restart plans. You know, as we begin to uh, really develop our strategies and the logistics um, with the direction from our public health committee and our facilities committee, there's a lot of work to be done. And, and our first and foremost concern is making sure that everyone is health and safe on this campus. And so our goal is to continue to support that. We have a lot of work that we're doing. We have about nine work groups, but I really wanna focus on the work of four uh, today. The first is, I think a topic that is on everyone's mind, which is continuing to work remotely. And so there is a lot of guidance on our website currently about flexible work arrangements. And so we are looking to formalize that into policy and reviewing all of our other uh, administrative policies and procedures to see what adjustments and modifications we need to make to those uh, to adjust to our new remote work environment. We are also, will be issuing some surveys that will go out to leaders and to staff to help to inform changes to what we've put out as guidance. And so you, you can expect to see those surveys coming out in the next couple of days. And I really encourage everyone to please take the time to fill out those surveys because your comments on how you've been working remotely really are very important to us and will help us to, to form and make revisions in policies and procedures where needed. The second area that we're working on is training. In addition to the training that Dean Claybo has mentioned, we're collaborating not only with her committee, but with facilities and other work, group, work groups within um, the broader restart committee structure to develop training, e-learning on Canvas and Accelerate to help to manage remote teams to work effectively remotely and provide all kinds of coaching and support to work now in this new environment. And I'm real excited about what that team is doing to help to make this a very smooth but engaging transition to our new normal. Um, the third area has to do with health and safety. This committee is working very closely um, with faculty from nursing and social work, as well as other internal and external partners in the development of all kinds of webinars and uh, virtual training to provide um, information, support, and guidance with respect to financial, physical, and mental health and wellness. This pandemic has changed the world. We know that. And we've been dealing with a lot of things fears, anxiety, grief, isolation, um, concerns on a wide spectrum of issues. And we are sensitive to that. And we wanna make sure that in addition to promoting how we get work done, but we get it done with everybody in the best possible frame of mind. And so there's uh, webinars and again, mobile apps and all kinds of great tools that will be rolled out in upcoming wellness calendar. And then the fourth area has to do with communications because we know it's critical that you know what's going on and what we're doing. And so that we can help to ease your concerns about what's, what's your area gonna look like when you come back. And so there are a lot of information will be coming out. You can look to the, uh, the coronavirus website, you can look to, to, to Today at Wayne and a lot of other messaging avenues. But I also want to speak to, we are collaborating very closely with the Office of Internal Audit and the Office of Research Integrity because we recognize that there will be concerns. There may be issues. We want to offer folks the opportunity to file complaints and you can do that through askhr at wayne.edu. You can do it at internalaudit.wayne.edu. And you can communicate directly either with 
union reps. But we also want you to know that when those complaints come in, they will be addressed and they will be addressed consistently and expeditiously. And so we want you to know that you have those opportunities. So there's a whole lot of other work going on. Thank you again for working so hard remotely and adjusting to a new normal and uh, stay tuned. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael Wright for questions and answers. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you everybody for, for those presentations. We, we are now up to nearly 2,000 people uh, viewing this, so we've got a whole lot of interest. I'll, uh, some of the questions sound like they've been answered, but some I think um, might, might be good to answer again. And one of the ones that President Wilson, you talked about before, and this may be for you or for the provost, who I know is in the, in the waiting room, will classes be face-to-face -face or online in the fall? And I know you've kind of answered that, but they want to know when a decision might be made. Yeah, so the, um, the most likely scenario is that there'll be a combination of person-to-person, uh, as well as remote or uh, online. The real question is what proportion would be face-to-face um, -face and, and what proportion would be remote or online? And that's the question we can't answer at this point right now because we wanna, we don't see a, a real need to make a decision as soon as possible. It's more important to make the right decision because it is it is such an important one to make the right decision based on the science and the public health. At the same time, we recognize that people have to plan and um, a decision has to be made well in, before the semester starts. So we were, I was talking to the provost about this and we think we probably need to make a decision really by mid July in order to have the the appropriate uh, planning time um, by you know mid-August or so when we start classes. Uh, Keith, you want to add to that? No, I think you've covered it very well, President. I think um, one of the things hopefully that you'll be seeing soon out of the uh, Academic Restart Committee is some suggestions about how to figure out how to establish that. Um, we have no uh, specific guidelines of 10%, 50%, 100% are supposed to be remote versus others. Uh, we want to really want to make it uh, something that integrates actually with Rob Davenport's uh, group and with Carolyn Hefner's group um, in terms of the facilities and, and what's capable for folks, as well as uh, Lori's group in terms of looking at um, maybe there's some classes that it's just easier uh, to be able to do it safely than compared to other classes. Um, laboratories and performing uh, arts uh, sorts of classes are ones that um, have typically needed to have more in-person, you know, person-to-person uh, -person sorts of interactions. And so uh, we're, we're trying to provide some guidelines and some suggestions for conversations to be made um, about how to actually do that. And so that it's going to vary across the, this great university that we have, so we'll see. Thank you. There, there have been a lot of questions and they were sort of covered about working from home. And even when this is all over, there have been people we have now, um, discovered that a lot of people can work very effectively from home. Will there be opportunities to continue doing that both when the order is lifted, but also uh, beyond that? Well, I'll take that one, Michael. Um, and absolutely, uh, we are encouraging remote work. You know, the, the one thing that this pandemic has taught us is uh, we can be warrior strong on and off campus. And right still keep operations moving smoothly and effectively. In fact, what we have heard so far is that many people have been more productive working from home, and we hope that that continues. Um, we are working on a return to work guide and a leader's checklist so that leaders can specifically make decisions about who should be on campus when we are able to come back on campus mm -hmm. by by deciding what work absolutely needs to be done on campus. And if, and if that work can continue to be done effectively and efficiently uh, remotely, we're going to encourage that. Okay, thank you very much. 
Lori, we've had um, a, a couple of questions coming in that might be good for you. One is, is will there be availability of PPE or face coverings from the university? And also, will, will people be required to be tested prior to returning to campus? Thanks, Michael. Um, those are great questions. The um, university has currently ordered a supply of reusable cloth face coverings. The current order includes three per faculty or staff member. And um, we know that they are in development, but have not yet arrived um, there, but there is a supply on campus available. And we would encourage that everyone who is, obviously the critical infrastructure workers have been wearing them. We ask that everyone who steps foot on the Wayne State campus wears a cloth face covering at a minimum. And that, again, if you don't have one available to you that you consult your supervisor about how we can get one to you before you choose to return to campus. Um, there is also an order um, being developed from the uh, Dean of Students Office to make sure that our students are supplied with cloth face coverings for return to campus. And the second question, Michael, was? Uh, both PPE and whether people needed to be tested. Oh, testing. So currently, the test testing strategies nationally, as you know, are developing as the science develops. The current recommendations are that people be, um, everyone who is going to live in congregate housing, so for us, that's the dorms, be tested prior to return to campus. And that everyone, obviously, who is symptomatic, who, who hits a positive on the daily screener, be tested. Um, we also have a recommendation from our public health experts that we do a random sample antibody testing, which will give us a, an answer about seroprevalence of the disease on campus. Not yet a good scientific indicator of diagnosis and not yet a reliable indicator of immunity. We don't know how much immunity or how long, but we expect that over the course of the summer, those testing strategies are going, the testing modalities will be um, a little more rigorous and therefore testing strategies a little better informed. So what I would say is we know for sure if you're moving onto campus, you will be tested before you move in. And anyone who is symptomatic will have a test. And the, um, the remainder of our testing strategy will adapt as new evidence emerges. Thank you very much. Dean Claybo, if you don't mind one more um, that maybe the public health is helping guide, will we, will we let people know about confirmed cases of COVID? That's a really good question. And um, it, a lot of people have asked us about this over um, the last number of weeks. As you can imagine, there's a balance between wanting to make sure that certainly everyone who's been in contact with someone who is either suspected or diagnosed will be contacted by our contact tracing process. So that will happen automatically. Um, in terms of posting to a public website, I think we have to balance wanting to make sure that people know the incidence of the disease, of disease on campus versus protecting individual privacy. So we're not going to recommend posting identi um, identifying information or identifiable information, but um, we do believe that the campus community should have access to transparent aggregate data um, that will allow us to make decisions about further action. Thank you. And in, in the website, uh, wayne.edu slash coronavirus, which is now more about the restart, um, when we first put that site up, it did notify people also protecting privacy that there were cases on campus. So so um, that, that's more transparent. Um, this one, perhaps for Rebecca and the president, Will there, are we considering with the financial situation, are we considering furloughs or layoffs? President Wilson, would you like me to respond to that? Yeah, go ahead and I'll, I'll add to it if necessary. Okay. Um, I guess I would answer that by saying we are considering all options. Um, right now, we are not uh, making any definite decisions about that, partially because there are a lot of unknowns in our financial future. Um, we don't know um, what's going to happen with the state 
uh, subsidies that we receive. We don't know what's going to happen with enrollment and with tuition next year. And so until we have more information, I think it would be premature to do anything um, as significant as uh, furloughs or layoffs. I do want to differentiate between those two terms. Um, we are using furloughs to describe uh, a temporary um, absence from work where you would not get paid. Um, a layoff would be a more permanent action where you would be, um, you would no longer be an employee of the university. Um, and obviously those are, are actions that we are trying to avoid, um, partially because they have a significant financial damage to the people who are subjected to them. Um, but we also need to preserve the university and make sure that we're here in the future to continue to teach and do research. So it's a very difficult decisions will need to be made, but we're not making them yet. We're investigating options, but not making decisions. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is that um, certainly as was already mentioned, there are a lot of variables. Uh, the enrollment is, is one. What happens with the uh, state appropriations is another. I you know the state is, is experiencing their own uh, financial difficulties. However, to be perfectly transparent, because I don't want anybody to say, well, there was a town hall and, and we were told this. Um, to be perfectly transparent, it's, you know, I, I cannot see a scenario unless uh, the very, very best scenario where we wouldn't have to do something to um, um, deal with the financial consequences of this coronavirus. All universities are going to be damaged to a certain extent, some more than others. We're uh, a bit lucky in the sense that we don't own a hospital uh, and uh, we don't get a lot of revenue from our athletics. So we're not depend we don't have a lot of expenses related to athletics. And uh, so we're a bit shielded uh, from that. And by the way, we don't uh, own our own housing anymore. Uh, that's uh, we have a a, a, um, a private partnership uh, with that. Having said that, um, almost all the scenarios show some level of uh, furloughs or and or layoffs may be necessary, but we want to be very clear to not make these type decisions. These are very big decisions. Not make these decisions. Uh, until we absolutely have to when the uh, when the financial picture is a lot clearer. Another advantage we have is that most universities have a, a fiscal year that ends end of June. Our fiscal year ends end of September. So we have a little bit more time to uh, develop our budget without making some decisions uh, until we have a, a clearer picture of the total uh, finances. Related to this, and this may be for Provost Whitfield or President Wilson, but what does the enrollment situation look like right now? Provost? Um, he's throwing that to me because I am the uh, forever optimist in this group. Um, right now, uh, our enrollment actually is ahead of pace of what it's been in the previous years. But that's it's a very volatile situation that you have to be careful of and, and not put too much stock in what we see at this point in time. In a normal year, we'd say, yeah, we feel pretty good about it. But uh, the way that um, uh, incidents and, and, and the progression of this may change, the complications with um, the kinds of restrictions that we may be under, people may make different decisions about what they want to do about coming to school. We are such an excellent option and opportunity for folks. I'm hoping that the, 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 the increase that we see right now actually will hold and that we get an opportunity to actually provide the kind of education that we can, that in some ways only Wayne State can uh, in this area. Uh, but some of the other factors are people are thinking about staying closer to home and Detroit being one of the being really the population center for the state, um, it makes sense that we're seeing an uptick. But I also think it's because of some of the great programs that have been being started in the last few years that are actually really great attractors to being able to come here. Last year, we had the second highest uh, freshman enrollment 
And the year before we had the highest enrollment. So in some ways, maybe we're capitalizing on people are actually understanding the great value that is uh, having a Wayne State education. So let's uh, everybody think positively that it's going to hold and that we're going to because that will provide us with some support in dealing with our financial situation. Uh, let me just say that that's the uh, most uh, guarded I I've heard the provost uh, <laughs> talk about the <that> enrollment. <laughs> It, it, unless you had something else to add, uh, Provost Whitfield, if you could just stay on there, because we did have some inquiries about the timing of the semester. Um, and I think it's related to the Notre Dame announcement. And should we think about um, going online after Thanksgiving or starting later in the semester, later in the fall, or things like that? Yeah, um, we've we've got a fantastic registrar in Kurt Krasinska, uh, who has been modeling what the implications would be. Um, there is so much that goes into it. Our academic restart committee. Was, was paging over uh, at least three different scenarios today. And the one that we're looking at uh, the most closely because it won't affect our accreditation, it won't affect things that, that we struggle with when, in terms of timing, um, because there are just some particular things about timing uh, in terms of trying to start early, is to look and do what, uh, and consider what a lot of universities are thinking about, which is that looking at Thanksgiving and saying, you know, that's a time when everybody kind of goes back home and they may actually uh, increase uh, the risk of bringing people back onto campus of thinking that maybe at, th at Thanksgiving time, we don't come back. We only have about a two week period of time where there's classes and then another week uh, that is of uh, uh, final exams. And so that might, be a that might be a time that works to be able to try to make sure that we keep our campus community as healthy and safe as possible. Um, but we're looking at the other implications for that. So just understand that we are looking at that as one possible opportunity because uh, uh, we think that there are some options there as well as that you're seeing a lot of schools think about doing that. Um, that has to be put together with uh, the kind and the amount of remote instruction that we're doing or already doing uh, and, and to see what that looks like in terms of a risk profile if we were to pull people back or bring them back after that Thanksgiving period. But uh, we will do our best to communicate as frequently and often as possible as those plans become more solid. Thank you very much. We've had a couple of questions on the, from the online audience about student service fees and whether or not those will be reimbursed based on the fact that a lot of folks are going to be online. And um, so we'll, we'll be looking to do the same thing that we did uh, when this first started and particularly for uh, the times during spring summer. And that is, is for courses that require you um, to, to use uh, materials in a classroom setting, um, whether it be a beaker or sulfur or something like that, those are fees that we won't, we'll make sure that students don't have to pay for. Um, but there are, uh, in terms of, uh, there are certain fees that go along with uh, being able to offer instruction. And so those will have to be in place but know that we, we look at them constantly. We actually work with chairs and faculty and departments to make sure that we don't assess any fee that would be for something that you would normally do when you were in person if we're in a remote situation. Uh, as the president noted, um, we're hoping that we'll have a mix of different sorts of classes. So there still may be those classes that are in-person classes, particularly laboratories, as well as some of our performance ones that actually do have fees that go along with them because that's how we make that great instructional opportunity for people is by um, those fees covering materials that are used in that instructional um, process. Okay, stay, stay right there because um, <laughs> we're getting some questions that are right in your wheelhouse. Can faculty make decisions to hold classes online even if there are some face-to-face -face classes? Uh, <clears throat> that's a, such an interesting question. That is what we've been spending probably the last week uh, being laser focused on and trying to figure out um, how do you establish that? We believe that maybe by the beginning of next week, middle of next week, it, uh, everybody have a happy Memorial Day, um, we'll be able to have some instructions for how to do that. We believe that the best way needs to be a cooperative um, uh, discussion between chairs and deans with faculty about um, issues rel related to their risk, um, issues related to the type of instruction or the type of course that they have and what instruction uh, might be best for them. Um, this, of course, is complicated uh, with in terms of uh, relative to space issues. And so uh, Rob Davenport and his group have been really helpful in us thinking about 
you know, some of these classrooms that are fantastic classrooms hold 250 people in a normal day when you do uh, proper spacing can probably only hold about 70, 75. So it will have an impact on which courses we're able to offer. But when we don't offer all of our courses in person, it's gonna offer some additional space as well. So there's gonna be some great opportunities there. Um, I don't think Darren uh, Hubbard is on the line, but um, in terms of uh, uh, information technology, he's already looking at ways in which we can try to increase the technology that we have for some of our classrooms. So <clears throat> they'll be better uh, able to provide us the opportunity to be able to, to, to do um, uh, multiple classroom settings, maybe for one class, um, different ways in which we'll divide that up. But um, you're going to have some instructions forthcoming about how we can be able to establish that and work that out. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you were on this call. Uh, Carolyn Hafner, we've had some questions about childcare issues and whether or not there's, you know, it's become, you know, folks are working, at, they're at home, they're with their children. Uh, if we come back, there'll be child, potentially childcare issues if the schools will remain closed. I know that some folks have been talking about that based on um, things I read online today, but do you have anything you can share with people about that particular issue? We, we don't have a defined answer just yet, but as you said, we, we are looking at that and, um, and we're working with a number of people to come up with some potential solutions. So I'm going to say at this point, please stay tuned and know that we are working on it. Okay. I understand we've got a lot, some questions coming in about the School of Medicine, and I would, I would ask, uh, ask those folks to uh, or just let you know that this is not the last of these types of communications, and I would expect the deans would be speaking to their schools and colleges about the specific issues faced by um, School of Medicine or any of our other uh, 12 schools and colleges. Um, Steve Lanier, I know you're in the, in the waiting room, but we've had some questions about labs getting back into working with labs, PhD students, you know, what, what, how are we doing as far as the planning of restarting labs and research? I think you're muted, Steve. We have a pretty large group that's been working on that for five or six weeks now. And um, the vice deans of research from multiple research intensive colleges. And there's a plan that was posted May 11th on the website for those of you that haven't had a chance to see that. Uh, and the plan is really a phased plan that is focused initially on on-site activities, uh, lab-based activities that can't be conducted remotely, consistent with the earlier messages that you've heard here. If you're enabled remote, stay remote uh, as we go forward into the next phase. Um, and so in, in that context and consistent with national guidelines and, and what we're trying to do across the three research universities on, in the state, we're targeting uh, starting off with 25, 30 percent of the level of activity pre-COVID in any given building at any given time. So all the labs and departments and colleges with activity in that sector have uh, been developing plans, how to implement that, that would maintain social distancing, uh, single point of entry uh, that's based on daily uh, completion of the health survey that Dean Claybo had mentioned. Um, so all the teams are assembled around that. We have signage that we are currently got some this afternoon to post in the facilities, thanks to communication. We have, um, we actually have um, 10,000 uh, face masks, cloth masks that we'll be providing to investigators and teams as they come on site that will uh, be there for as the other ones come on board. Um, and um, so we, the idea is that in the different colleges, we're gonna start off in a slow way, if you will, to make sure we do it right. I mentioned the 25%, but even in the context of individual colleges, uh, to try and start with one building uh, and get that operational, that's where the plans are really tight, and then to learn from that and go with the next one. So each of the different vice deans for research are coordinate with their own internal working team to target that, and I hope clarity on that over the next few days. Everybody coming on, on track would um, be... Um, uh, required to take the training module that Dean Claybo mentioned, 
Uh, we also anticipate there'll be additional training platforms through entities like City, Module, et cetera, uh, coming into play. Um, we are not uh, allowing undergraduate researchers to come back in as part of this phase ramp up. Um, trainees, graduate students will come in, but they have to go through a development plan uh, and go through the part of that training procedure, et cetera. Each of the labs have a standard operating procedure for cleaning twice daily. That includes a disinfectant that Rob mentioned. Uh, in addition, we have wipes that we should have next week, which are EPA approved wipes for touch points, uh, services, cleanings, shared instrumentation, et cetera, which we'll provide to investigators as they come on campus. So all of that is coming into place relative to students and staff. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable coming in, um, we want to be sure we have an environment where people don't feel pressured. And this has been top of the line, top of the discussion since the beginning. You don't want students or staff to feel that they're pressured to come in to complete this or not. So that's sort of built into the discussion and checks and balances around that, including the, I don't know if I call it hotline or vehicle to convey concerns mentioned by my colleague Carolyn earlier. So that's a general synopsis, and, and uh, you can look at the website almost every day to get a better update on things. Rob Davenport, thank you, Steve. Rob, the, we had a, a couple of questions about air quality, and in particular about the the fogging that you mentioned, and how often would that occur, and would that be in classrooms, or uh, in, and how often would we do that? So the fogging would would be utilized if we have a um, a known case. Uh, then we would use that device to disinfect uh, the room. Um, otherwise, we would, you know, continue to adhere to uh, the basic plan of surface cleaning, whether it's with a disinfectant uh, spray or or wipes. So yeah, that that's our plan with regard to um, uh, the main the maintenance of the uh, of those matters, and then reacting to an actual case. Okay, thanks very much. Sure. We had a question about international and Canadian students. Canadians are international students. Are there any special considerations because they're having a harder time getting here or, or working from a uh, home country or anything like that? I think Provost Whitfield, that may be, uh, I know Rod's working on that, but he's not, on the, he's not in the uh, chat room yet. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, it's very interesting. We've been trying to figure out lots of different strategies for making sure that our international students can actually engage with us. Maud Ezzedine has been working uh, closely with the schools and colleges, thinking about ways in which um, for some students, um, they may even be in a time zone where what they can do is be part of a class that might be done remote. Um, there might be some online opportunities for those. And I really wanna make that distinction between remote and online. Remote is at a scheduled time, it tends to be synchronous and online is asynchronous um, and, you know, we have over 400 courses um, in, in a given year that we actually offer online. And so we'll be doing some of those. So there'll be some opportunities. Um, we're just trying to figure out ways in which we can try to support those students because not being here in the United States actually uh, has uh, uh, several restrictions in terms of uh, the kinds of courses that we can offer them and, and, uh, and how much they have to pay, whether it's in state or out of state. We're, thinking about all those ways that we can make sure that we try to support our international students as much as possible. Um, there's, there's going to be some just because uh, in certain countries, uh, the visa offices won't open until into the fall. And so those students might not be able to come. So we're even thinking about ways in which we can uh, perhaps delay their entry uh, back into either starting a graduate program or into a graduate program, for example. Um, but all of these are, are being looked at. I encourage you to look at the Office of International Student Support, OISS, uh, and uh, they are very good about communicating the kinds of opportunities and support that are provided for our students. Thank you very much. We've got time for one more question, and I think uh, the president's going to close it out, and we'll have follow-up information if necessary. But Tim Michael, I, I hope you're still in the, in the room. We've had a number of questions about housing. Um, one, are there going to be refunds if, if we don't have housing? And two, just in general, how, are we going to have housing or is there anything different about how we're going to do it? Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I've been working with the group looking at housing and dining and other retail services, campus services for the campus for fall. 
Um, at this time, we, we are open. We are taking housing applications. We're on similar pace to last year. Students still seem interested in to come and live with us. What we're doing is coordinating very closely with the, um, the Health Policy Committee to make sure that we can create an environment where students can be safe and feel safe. And, and then we want to make sure we communicate what that environment will be like so students can then make, their, make choices about how they want to engage with campus housing. So yes, we, we will be open. Um, we uh, don't know the future. I think you, what you've heard on this call is we're trying to do a lot of planning around scenarios of what might happen as the semester unfolds. And so I, I'd like to believe we'll be as flexible and innovative as we were in the spring semester when we were, were, uh, were really making decisions on a daily basis and we'll continue to do that. But planning's in progress, and we're looking forward to welcoming students back to campus in August. All right, thank you, Tim. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over in a second to the president um, to, for any closing thoughts. We had a lot of questions, we had uh, you know lots of questions. Thank you everybody for submitting them. We've tried to get to as many of them in as many categories as possible. I didn't expect on this call to get them, but we had questions about the, the, the recreational activities, the rec center, the athletics and things like that, and I know President Wilson, that uh, that's near to your heart. And uh, but we'll have other opportunities to talk about this. And I know Rob Fournier, who also chairs a subcommittee purely on athletics, is working closely with NCAA, et cetera, to, uh, to figure out what our fall and then our, our athletics uh, is going forward. I would just encourage everybody, uh, we're going to be sharing more and more information in a number of channels. Go to wayne.edu slash coronavirus. There's, that's where we're going to be ke uh, keeping update, up to date on information. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll just keep talking and there'll be more of these uh, to come from, from various units. So President Wilson, would you like to close this out? Uh, sure. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> um, certainly we've covered a lot today. We weren't able to cover everything. Athletics was uh, mentioned as one thing that is on people's minds, as well as whether the uh, rec center is going to open, things like that. Let me just assure everyone that a lot of people are giving a lot of thought to all of these issues. If this was helpful to you, and I hope it was, we'll be happy to come back and do it again. We certainly will do it at least one more time uh, later in the summer uh, before the fall, but we're happy to do it as many times as you think it's helpful. So hopefully it was helpful. And, um, uh, you know, if there's you know, a demand for it, we will certainly uh, come back on again. The main message that I think I want to just leave everyone with is that as the new guidelines uh, start coming out, for example, everybody has to wear a face mask if you're in, in an indoor building. Um, we encourage everyone to comply with the new guidelines and to encourage everyone else to uh, comply. You know, it's going to be a team effort and we're, we're all going to have to be in this together. So with that, um, thank you, Michael, for uh, uh, doing this and thank you to all the uh, participants. And I, as I mentioned, I hope it was helpful and we're happy to do it again. Thank you all. Good evening.